Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year's Eve. We're going to cover a lot of ground this morning, so I'm, I'm really going to hop right into the lesson for today. And it's New Year's Eve, so I was praying, like, Lord, what do you want, what do you want to share with your people today? And, and God really placed this on my heart, was to, for us to be pressing toward Christ as we look into 2024. So that's really the theme for today. We're going to unpack that as we, we go forth today. And so when I was doing research, just trying to get some background on what are some of the goals that people plan for in 2024? And I came across an article in, it was in Forbes actually, and it was from November, so it's kind of current. Uh, am I really loud? It's not like I'm loud. Maybe it's just me. No, we're good? Okay. But it was over a thousand people and, and it says 48% uh, of those people were looking for physical fitness was one of their goals. And 38% wanted to do financial improvements. 36 was um, improve their mental health. I thought that was kind of different. And then it has some other categories about smoking. I think that's one that comes up quite a, quite a bit. People wanting to quit smoking and doing more hobbies. When I thought about it, I said, well, that's probably a pretty fair stat. I know a lot of people really want to improve their, their fitness. I definitely have made that one of my New Year's resolutions. I'm going to get healthier this year. And in fact, the most crowded time in the gym is the first of the year. You go to the gym, you know, January 1st, January 2nd, you can't get on a machine. That place is packed. You can't get in there. But you wait for about two months, you know. <laughs> it starts start weaning off, you know, because it's a grind. Some people are dedicated. They wake up early in the morning they go. But those who are really dedicated, those who are really faithful, they, they make the time to continue to do that. But... I, it's still good to have a goal to do those kind of things. And, and what we're talking about today is not something that we want to replace our goals, but we definitely want to make sure we have our right goal intact for what we're doing going forward. So we want to look at the Apostle Paul, because Paul had a goal too. So we want to look at the goal that he had and, and how can we glean some things out of that to help us in our, our walk with the Lord. And we want to kind of look at Paul's life or his goal as a rubric or some type of measuring device that we can measure ourselves and how we're doing. And the first verse we're going to look at is Philippians 3, verses 13 through 14. We're actually going to be looking at Philippians 3 quite a bit. Paul gives an account of his life in this, this chapter. And, but the first verse is, two verses is out of Philippians 3, 13 and 14. It'll be on the screen for us, but it says, brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul tells the church in Philippi of his journey. This is a, uh, a time of reflection for Paul, much like us. We sometimes will sit down and we'll give an account like, hey, where have I been? Where am I now? That's what's happening with Paul. He's giving a reflection. He's looking back and, and letting them know about his life. And he's being transparent as well. He's, he's sharing some things. Paul is recalling where God had brought him from and where he was now. And, and to give some context to this, by the time Paul is writing this, this book, you know, God is using Paul to write this, of course, through the Holy Spirit. But he's been in ministry about 30 years. 
So he's done a lot of things for the Lord. God has used him to do miracle signs and wonders. God has used him to to show how how powerful he is and how much he loves us. And so God has done a lot of things in Paul's life up until this point. And you know, before Paul actually um, started serving God, he was on the other side of the team. He was playing for the other team, so to speak. He wasn't always a follower of Christ. And we have an account of that in Acts 9. If you've never read it before, we're going to look at Acts 9, verses 1 through 7. And again, it'll be on the screen for us. And this is, this is part of Paul's history. And in fact, in the beginning, his name wasn't Paul, it was Saul. But after he came to know the Lord, he changed his name. So verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if they found any there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could, not, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. This is Paul's encounter with God. And, and Paul was blind until God actually sent a man named Ananias to pray for him. And, and as you read this, this passage, you read down a little further, it says like something like scales fell off his eyes. But Paul was praying, though. He was, during that time, he was praying, too. Reflecting, I'm sure. You know, Paul was a different person after this. He even changed his name because the first king of Israel was named Saul. So there was some royalty that kind of tied with that name. But he didn't, he didn't see himself that way anymore. He even changed his name to Paul to mean little. He changed everything about himself. God knew how to get Paul's attention. And so I was thinking about this. God knows how to get our attention too, church. God knows how to reach us. And not only does he know how to reach us, he knows how to reach our children that we're praying for. He knows how to reach our loved ones that we're praying for. And every one of us in here, we're praying for somebody, a family member. We are. God knows how to reach them. We're not necessarily praying that he would knock them off a horse like he did Paul, but you know, some of them probably could use a good whack. <laughs> Y'all know it's true. <laughs> Paul didn't let the past dictate his future. He did. He said he forgot those things that were behind and he, he reached forward. And when I was you know, researching some of this, when it's talking about reaching forward, it's, it's like a, a, a runner. You ever seen a runner, especially with the 100-yard dash or the 100-meter dash? Man, they're, they're booking. I mean, their hands are going. I mean, legs going. Everything is leaning forward. And even when they get to the very end where that little rope is that they have to break, man, they stick their head out. Everything is, is moving forward. That's what Paul is saying. He's, he's saying, he, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward. Everything, everything within me is moving forward. And church, that really should be our posture too. We should be leaning, leaning forward, especially as we get ready to go into 2024. This is our encouragement this year. We want to be leaning forward. And... We've all had different experiences in, in 2023, and, and to help us to kind of reflect and, 
and kind of house our thinking for today, I, I, we're going to look at three different perspectives of how we could reflect on 2023 and, and look into 2024. The first perspective we may have for some of us is that we're just thankful 2023 is over. Some of us, I heard that already. <laughs> They're just glad 2023 is over. And some of us, of us may be that way. But I would say this, God is still faithful. And if you're in the hearing of my voice, you can say God is faithful too because you're still here. Yeah. Something could have, could have taken us out. But God, he saw us through trials. He helped us to persevere in ways that we really didn't know if we were going to make it or not. But God saw us through. And I get a chance to talk to a lot of people. And I hear we go through a lot of things. We go through some heavy things in life. But God was faithful. And somehow he made it, helped us to get through. You know, it's, it's good for us to reflect, too. It's good for us to reflect and to kind of think back what God has brought us through. Because we go from one thing to another. Like, oh, you know, hey, man, whew, I survived that one. And we're gone. But we forget about what God just did in our life. I mean, he, he made things possible that we really didn't see. He brought people into our lives that we didn't know that were going to be there. That really sparks a heart of thankfulness. And that towards the end of the service today, we're going we're gonna to pray. I, I just felt like that's how we need to enter 2024. So we want to give God thanks. We want to give God thanks because he is faithful. So Paul had been in ministry for some time, and, but he realized God hadn't finished with him. God was still working in his life. And, and if we look in verse 12, still in the Philippians 3, Paul makes this statement. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So here, Paul is, is saying that he hadn't made it to perfection yet. And he's using this as an example, actually. He's telling the, the church of Philippi, hey, I've been doing this for 30 years, and God is not finished with me. And so, church, we really don't, as Christians, we don't retire. We don't hang up, you know, our, our spiritual, <laughs> spiritual heels or um, spiritual hat. God has always got something for us to do. We, we don't quit. You know, we retire when we get to heaven. I'm not sure what we'll be doing up there. It'll be glorious. But while we're still here, God has something for us to do. He's got something for us to do. It might be something different. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be doing the same thing you've always done. But he's got something else for us to do. That's what Paul was telling the church in Philippi. And so what was... Paul talking about he hadn't obtained yet. And again, we're in Philippians 3. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11. Paul gives a little a description about what he had, hadn't obtained yet. I think we can draw some things out of this. Philippians 3, verse 7, it says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow obtain to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul is saying here that whatever he knew before, it paled in comparison to knowing Christ. It didn't mean if... If it was some terrible things that were in his past 
or even if it was something that was really good, he said, it's, it's garbage compared to knowing, knowing Christ. And, and he wanted, Paul wanted to be in Christ. That was his, his desire. He wanted, he wanted to know Christ. And when you look at that word know, it's not just necessarily a head understanding. It means an experience. He wanted to experience God daily. He, he, didn't want to hear, he didn't want to know about God through somebody else. He wanted to have his own personal experience with God. He wanted to, to know him. And, and he even said he wanted to participate in his suffering. I was like, oh, Paul, pump your brakes. <laughs> you know, let's not get carried away here. Suffering, that's, that's nobody wants to suffer. But when you start to dig in a little deeper into that, it has some other connotations to this meaning, but it means that to have the capacity to feel strong emotions for. So what, what we take away from that is that Paul, he wanted to know what would drive Christ to the cross to die for him. He wanted to know that love. What kind of love does God have that he would give his life for us? He wanted to know. He wanted to know that kind of love. That's the kind of passion he had. And, and Paul said he wanted to become like Christ in his death, meaning that he just wanted to mortify the flesh. All those the desires that wasn't like God, he wanted those things to, to fall away. And of course, he wanted to obtain the resurrection from death. He wanted, he wanted to be in heaven. And if you look in the scripture, he talks about that. I think it's 2 Corinthians 5. He talks about he was torn between wanting to be in heaven or wanting to be here to stay here. His heart, his desire was to be with the Lord. And so Paul said he hadn't obtained these things. He was still trying to get there. And church, that's us. God is still working on us. We are a work in progress that God is doing in our life. I don't care if we've been saved for one day or we've been saved for 50 years. We have not yet arrived, and God is still working in our life. And that's an encouragement, too. It's like, hey, you know, I, I, I still need God's help. And I can find his help, too, because he's, he's faithful. And that was true for Paul, and that's true for us as well. So Paul's history, I'm sure at times, would, would lag at him, would... Um, maybe taunt him a little bit. I mean, he's sharing this, this testimony, so apparently there's something in his past, but he's saying that he didn't let those things get him down. But you better believe that it would, it would come up in his thinking sometimes. So what's in our background? What's, what's some baggage that we might be carrying? What's some things that might be holding us, weighing us down? keeping from pressing on towards Christ, we have to leave those ways behind. It's time. It's time to leave those things behind and, and we need to press on towards the prize of Christ because whatever it is in the past has been covered by the blood of Christ. If we know the Lord, whatever's in the past is under the blood of Christ and there's a a passage in John, John chapter 8, verse 34 through 36. This is Jesus speaking here. And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. If Christ sets us free, we are free indeed. That's a beautiful verse. Nothing's holding us at all. We are free, church. And whatever things were in the past, let's let them go. And I was reading some commentary about, uh, it's more towards Romans, but it was talking about that freedom that we have. And get this image in your head that 
Uh, there's a, a prison cell, but the doors have been blown off. That's what happens when Christ comes into our life. Whatever jail cell, whatever thing that was holding us before, the doors are gone. They're gone. But we have to come out of that. You know? So what, what happens is if Christ has set us free from something and we start trekking back into those things before, it's like we're going into a, a prison cell that there's no doors to it, but we have to come out of that. We don't go back to those old things because if we do, we're making ourselves a slave to it again. When he's come to set us free. And we are free. In Romans 6, 12, it talks about that. Romans 6, 12 and 13. It says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. That's our goal. Not to go back. Don't go back to the things that God has set us free from. We have a higher calling. And that calling is Christ. And that's what Paul was talking about. That's how he, f- he fixed his, his eyes. That's what he was looking for. And when we have a life that we're doing that, we're pursuing Christ, there's a joy. There's a joy in our life because we're in a relationship with Christ. And, and if we're wavering in that, that, that joy is dampened. But when we're, doing a, 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 when we're following Christ, when we're, we're pursuing him, because of that relationship, there's a joy. And Christ says, if we, when we do that, it's, he says that, that, might, that your joy might be full if we walk in obedience to him. That's what he's talking about. Because there's a relationship with him. And I don't know what your circumstance is today. I don't know what you've been through. Everybody goes through different things. But I do know God. And I know he keeps his promises. So for us, we have to grab a hold of those promises that he's, he's given us. Our second perspective we may have is that 2023 was an, was an awesome year. I wish it would never end. Total opposite of, of, of the other perspective. And I, I pray a lot of us had that kind of year. And if somebody had that kind of year, rejoice with them. Be happy. We'd be happy that somebody's doing well. We're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice. But for us who had this wonderful year, our encouragement is for us to be thankful. To be thankful. Because it was God that gave us the ability to prosper. It was God that gave us the ability to be successful. It was him. And you know, Paul was a very, a very accomplished man. He was. And we see that in, again, in Philippians 3. We're looking at verses 3 through 6 here. Paul gives us a little, little bit of his background. He gives us a, a little bit of his resume. Because he gave up everything to follow Christ. But he had a... He had a He has some standing that he had before. Philippians 3, verse 3, down through 6, it says, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. For if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, flawless, faultless. 
Paul had a, a glowing reputation by the world standards. <laughs> he was taught by a renowned teacher named Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee. By the world standards, he had, he had it going on. But Paul, he didn't use his pedigree to boast about. The only thing that he boasted about was Christ. That's, that's all he boasted about. He even changed his name from Saul to Paul. Church, we should be thankful. We should be thankful. If God has blessed us this year, we should be thankful. Because every James says every good and every precious gift comes from above. It comes from God. So we should reflect on 2023 and give God thanks for giving us the wisdom to be creative, to, to have the, the understanding to, to know how to produce and, and to be marketable. We should give God praise for the strength to wake up every day, to go to work, to, to have the, the ambition God placed all those things in us. And even the opportunities, the doors that he opened up, that was God. And we have to recognize that. We got to recognize that. And we got to give him thanks. There's a, hey, hey man, we give God some praise for that. And so we want to look at this story just real briefly because there's an example of this in, in the first book of the Bible. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. It's, it's a story of Cain and Abel when they were bringing God an offering. Verse 3, it says, When it was time for harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift the best portion of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Abel was, he was thankful. He was grateful to God, and it, it showed. It showed in his, his offering. He gave God his very best. He gave God his, his first. And it, it showed up. And God accepted it. Cain brought an offering too. But it, it wasn't. He, he just, he brought God something. And there's a difference. There's a difference. We should have that kind of heart. A heart like Abel. We should be praying for a heart like Abel to bring God our very, very best. If we can give our work, if we can give our, our, our education, we can give whatever it is in our life, 110%, what do we bring God? What do, what do we bring him? And I know it's a challenging statement. That's something for us to, to go to God ourselves. But God, does, he deserves it. And we're a work in progress. God's not done with us, okay? He's not. But that's a challenge for us today. That's a challenge for us to give God our best, especially as he's been so good to us. He's been good to us anyway, but if we had a bountiful year, man, we need to respond. The last perspective we have is that I don't know what to expect of 2024. And I, I think a lot of people are that way, to be honest with you. That's why they have so many articles that come out and suggestions, hey, a new year, new you, and, and they have all kinds of things to, to help us to improve ourselves. And again, we, we, should, we should be trying to better ourselves. Definitely. We should always be doing that. But for us as Christians, what, what should be... What should be our aim for 2024? And I believe, as we look at Paul's goal, 
Our goal should be the heavenly call in Jesus Christ. And when we look at our lives through the lens of the prize of Jesus Christ, it gives us purpose for our life and how we ought to live it. It gives us aspirations, goals, things we should be striving for in our lives. And Paul says here in verse 14 of Philippians 3, he says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And Paul is saying that he, when he pressed, just as we talked about before, he's reaching forward to the end to receive that heavenly prize. And when you look up that word, to press, it's like a, a hunter that's going to, to shoot his game. I mean, he's tracking it down. He's on target. He's, he's got to be in step with it. He's got to study. I'm not a big deer hunter, but I, I've, I've dabbled in it. And I know those guys, they go out before hunting season and they, they, they observe. They know where to put their, their little deer stand. They know, they, they know what to do. That's what Paul is talking about here. He's, he's pressing. He's trying to actually follow the steps of Christ. And, and so what's happening here is that there is a sense of urgency. Paul's not taking his walk with, with the Lord lightly. He's pursuing. He's not taking it casual. It's not a casual thing for Paul. He's intentional. Things that have happened in his life, he's, he's, he's seeking those things out. He's being strategic. So as believers, how are we going to know what to do, where to go, if we're not tracking? If we're not following Christ, if we're not observing, if we're not following his example, how are we going to know? Paul had a, a heavenly mindset. He was always thinking about the prize that, that Christ had for him. And in Colossians 3, verses 2, it's the same author. Paul is just writing a, a different book. But this is what he says. And we're, we're winding down here. He says, think, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. It's for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glories. And how did Paul do this? He forgot the things that were behind. He didn't hold on to those things, whether they were good or whether they were bad. He didn't care. He was putting his eyes on the prize. And, and that's a commentary that I saw here. It says that just as a runner, runner speed is slackened, should he take, should he think of those behind him and the thud thud of their pounding feet? So the Christian's onward progress is hindered should he dwell on the past full of failures and sins full of heartaches and discouragement, full of disappointments and thwarted hopes and plans. And that's true. If you're running a race and the, the tape is in front of you, if you're worried about who's over here, worried about who's over there, it's going to take your focus off. And you're gonna, you, you may not even know it, but you're slowing down because you're thinking, you're thinking about these instead of thinking about where you're supposed to be going. There's a, a story in John... John 21, where God is, is, is directing Peter, telling Peter to feed his sheep. He's like, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. He tells him three times. And Peter looks over and says, well, what about John? God said, don't you worry about John. He said, you follow me. Don't worry about what's going on in the peripheral. We should be following Christ. I don't care what's, if, if you're on Facebook or whatever, if somebody's having a hard time, pray for them. If they had something wonderful, rejoice with them. But we follow Christ. We follow Christ. 
So Paul is saying he puts all distractions aside. That's what Paul is saying. He forgets everything. He puts everything behind him. And that can be difficult because people, we go through difficult things, temptation, thoughts, things that we, we struggle with. So our encouragement this, this New Year's Eve is to fix our eyes on, on Christ. And to help us do that, there's a verse in Isaiah 26, verse 3. It's a very simple passage, but it's, it's a good one. It says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. It's all about Jesus. He's the one that, that saved us. He's the one that's keeping us. Amen. But the thing about it, we have to constantly pull our, our minds back to the promises of Christ and who God is. That's, that's a constant. But we gotta fix our minds, fix our eyes on the things above, just as Paul says. So whether we had a tough year in 2023 or whether it was a bountiful year in 2023, Paul says we should be looking forward. That's what really matters. And so we have some takeaways for us here. And, and after the takeaways, we're going we're gonna to pray and give God thanks for for what for 2023, for keeping us, for his faithfulness. But for the first one is reflect on 2023, but don't bring sin, failures, or false pride into 2024. Leave all those things behind. They're just going to be weights. They're going to be baggage. They're going to slow us down in our, our walk. And we have to continue to grow and mature. Just like Paul said, we don't graduate. You know, we, we contend, continually be transformed. We're continually being transformed into the image of Christ. Number two, it says, give God thanks for his faithfulness. Somehow God made a way for us in 2023. Somehow he did. Only you know what you've been through. Only, knew, only you know what obstacles you had. God made a, a way for you. And we should give my very best. He deserved that. He's worthy of that. And the last is, on 2024, we should focus, focus on Jesus. And should we look at our life through the lens of Jesus Christ, get in the word. If you don't read your, your Bible, we were talking about it, Tim was talking about it in the beginning. We have a reading plan. How are we going to know where to go if we're not following Christ? We'll find, up, find ourselves in some interesting places if we don't, if we don't put our, our eyes and our minds on him. And if you're in the word, stay in the word. Continue. Number two, keep our minds on Jesus. Commit quiet time and with God daily. This really talks about relationships. When we're spending time with God, when we're, we're sitting with him, we're building that relationship. If you're, if you're extremely busy, I was talking to a gentleman once, he's just very, very busy. I said, man, on your way home, just pull over and pause for 10 minutes and put your mind on, on Christ. And the wonderful thing about it is Jesus is inside of us. He, wherever we go, he's with us. You'd be walking in Walmart shopping and you could be having a conversation with God. Just don't do it out loud. <laughs> okay? You might get some looks. But you can always be talking to God. Where you go, he's, he's, he's right there with you. Commit time with the body of Christ. Get into a, a community group and a Bible study. We build each other up. Scripture says we sharpen each other. When we're around each other, we encourage each other. And, and you yourself, you encourage other people. It makes a difference. And the last is to disciple a new believer. 
And I think that's important, especially if we've been a Christian for, for some time. Um, if we're not careful, we become stagnant. And when you think about it, it's like, well, hey, if we're wanting God to pour more into us, why should he if we're not going to be pouring into anybody else? We should be a flowing river. And, and what's so beautiful is that when you're sitting down and talking to somebody, sharing a verse that you've read dozens of times, but for them, man, when they're reading it for the first time, and you see them, you see them, you see them starting to realize that they are free. You start to realize, hey, this is what God has called me into. And as you're experiencing their joy, somehow it makes you recount your own testimony, what God has done for us. And man, it, it really ignites you. And God has called us to do that anyway, to make disciples. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Pray about that. Pray about that. We have a lot of new people coming to the church, a lot of new believers. Grab one of them. Say, hey, let's go through a book of Mark. Let's, let's sit down and, and just talk. It would benefit them and would benefit you as well. So what we want to do is I want you to stand to your feet as we, as we close. And I, wanna, I want us to pray and just give God thanks. I know you've been sitting down for a while. If I ever need to do this, get your... But I want to lead the prayer. But at the same time, you know your own journey. You know what God has brought you through. So I'll be praying in, in general, praying as a whole. But you yourself, you can pray from your heart. You can give God thanks as well. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for, for 2023, Lord. Lord, you were faithful. Lord, you watched over us. You watched over our homes, Lord. You provided for us, Lord. Lord, even while we were traveling up and down the road, Lord, you, you watched over us. We don't take it for granted, Father, that we're here today, Lord. Our circumstance could have been different, Lord, but you watched over us. You watched over our families, Lord. In places that we couldn't be, Lord, you were there. And Lord, there, there's been times we've been sick, Father. You watched over us, Lord. We, we, we've been to the hospitals, Lord. We've had surgeries, Lord, but you watched over us, Lord. Lord, we cried out to you. We asked for help, Lord, and that's what we found, Lord. We, we found you. We found your help, Lord, because you're faithful, Lord. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, you're ever-present help in time of trouble, of time of need, Lord, and you, you're worthy. You're worthy of our very best, Lord. Thank you for 2023, Lord. We know you're going to be faithful in 2024 because that's, that's who you are, Lord. Lord, you do take us from glory to glory. You take us from, from victory to victory, Lord. That's, that's who you are. You can do anything but fail, Lord. You cannot fail, and you will not fail, Lord. And Lord, that's us. That's our, our, our inheritance, but we are in you. We're seated in you in heavenly places, Lord. So, Lord, even if we have a hard time trying to figure out what we've, we've gone through, Lord, we are blessed because you came and you died for us, Lord. We have an inheritance that will not spoil, that will not fade, Lord. That's our hope. When we're going through something difficult, Lord, we realize, Lord, you're never going to leave us in a place, Lord. You have a plan and a purpose for our life, Lord. So we grab a hold to that, Lord. But yet, Lord, we all, at the same time, Lord, we trust, Lord, you're going to meet us right now in our own circumstance, Lord. You're going to show up, Lord. You tell us to wait. It's good to wait on the Lord. Lord, we're going to wait. And that time is never wasted, Lord. Because even while we're waiting, Lord, Lord, we're calling on you. Even while we're waiting, Lord, Lord, we, we're reaching out to you, Lord. Even while we're waiting, Father God, we are pouring our hearts out to you, just like David, Father. Lord, he didn't leave anything out. He gave the good, the bad, and the ugly. He shared it all, Lord. And I pray that would be us, Lord. We share it all, Lord. You already know it. 
You already know all about us, Lord. I pray, Father, Lord, we would surrender. Lord, we would just bring it all, Lord. There wouldn't be any secrets between us and you. There are no secrets between you and us. I pray, Father, we would just open up our lives, Lord, and let you just flow through us, Lord, that we may receive the healing, the freedom that you've called us into, Lord. Lord, let us never come into this place the same, Lord, that we're carrying burdens, Lord. When you are the answer, Lord, you are our help. You've been our help this past year. Lord, we didn't know where to go, Lord. We went to you. Lord, you kept us from losing our, losing our minds, Lord. There's, there's times, Father, we didn't know how we were going to make it through, Lord. The weight of the heaviness, Lord, made us think at times that we were going to lose our minds. But, Lord, you kept us. You kept us, Father. And we're thankful, Lord. And, Lord, we have a confidence, Lord. We have an expectation, Lord, because of what you've done before, Lord. Lord, we're not only going to go into the new year, Lord. We're going to thrive, Lord. Lord, we're going to do excellent things, Lord, because you go before us, Lord. We have a hope. We have an expectation, Lord. And you're going to use us for your glory, Lord. That's the exciting part. That's what Paul was talking about. That's why his, he, he was so excited, Lord, because he was following you, Lord. You were going to do excellent things in his life. He had seen it, Lord. And that's our testimony as well, Lord. You're going to do wonderful things in our life. And we're going to see some things. They're going to be heavy. But, Lord, we're going we're gonna to go to you. We're going to get our things to you. We're not going to let them weigh us down, Lord. We're not going to let the, the past weigh us down, Lord. We're going to bring them to you. And we're going to find the help. We're going to find the strength in 2024, just as we did in 2023.